Welcome back to the Hour View Podcast. On today's episode, I welcome my guest, Tiffany Yu. Tiffany is a social impact entrepreneur, podcaster, disability advocate, and three-time TEDx speaker. Join our conversation as we discuss her life of living with a disability and also the importance of allyship within the disability community. Welcome back to the Hour View Podcast, where we aim to raise awareness, educate, and change the tone of conversation about disabilities. I am very happy to uh, welcome my guest today, Tiffany Yu, and um, we are looking for uh, forward to having a great conversation uh, about allyship uh, in the disability community and what you can do as a person uh, who doesn't have a disability, uh, what you can do uh, to be an ally to those within the disability community. So Tiffany, welcome to the podcast. And I'm uh, very happy to uh, have you on as a guest today and looking forward to our, our conversation. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So um, if you could, could you just introduce yourself and tell us who is Tiffany? Uh, you know, who you are, what you do, and a fun fact or two about you. <laughs> Sure. So I am, uh, so my name's Tiffany and I'm the first generation daughter of a Taiwanese immigrant and a refugee from the Vietnam War. I do think it is important to highlight that because I often find, uh, especially now in the current context, there's been just a lot of erasure of Asian American identity. And that's a big part of uh, how it influenced the lens through which I viewed disability in my story. So at the age of nine, I was involved in a car accident where I became disabled. I permanently paralyzed one of my arms. And that same accident also took the life of my dad. So not only was it a disability origin story for me, uh, it was also, you know, a change in my family unit and really understanding uh, and moving through my own grief process. And so healing to me really needed to look more holistic than just, you know, physical therapy uh, and, and other things like that. So Fast forward, what is it, 24 years, fast forward 24 years. Uh, today, I run, a, uh, I run a social enterprise that's on a mission to accelerate disabled lives through community, visibility, and engaged allyship. And so my organization is called Diversability. And as a result of having created that, 12 years ago now, I started in 2009, wow. I've had some really incredible opportunities to you know, grow a couple branches off of this diversability tree. So uh, I also uh, host these monthly micro grants for disability projects. Um, and I also serve on the San Francisco Mayor's Disability Council. That's great. It's so, uh, I, I love being able to interview people and to hear uh, their stories. And um, the work that you do is, is so great. And it's so important that, um, you know, that there are people like yourself to, uh, you know, start companies and, and to um, engage with people who have disabilities and those who don't have disabilities, just because, um, as, as I said, to change the tone of conversation about disabilities, that is so important. And we have to reach out to those um, outside of the disability community um, in order to make that happen and to, uh, you know, have allies that are just all over, uh, all over the place that are uh, there to support us and, and help us out. Uh, one of the things you mentioned is um, uh, that you are the first generation of uh, Taiwanese um, an immigrant. And can you can you talk about that and how that has shaped your um, shaped your view of disability? I, I'm really interested in hearing a little bit more about that. Yeah, and I and I always love hearing people's journeys into growing into their disability identities, right? Because yeah. I didn't become disabled on day one and be like, yes, you know, I hit the jackpot. So there right. is, and I wanna mention that for those of us who do acquire our disabilities or maybe it becomes progressive over time, there is grief, right? And part of that grief journey is kind of sitting in the softer spaces of, of that journey until you realize, hey, this is my new reality. I can choose to either sit in this hard place uh, 
and right. I always feel like all of these are additive. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> in, t- taking that improv term, uh, how can I use this to be a catalyst to, uh, to change the tone, as you said, or to, to make change or to make an impact. So, uh, so yeah, so first generation, the reason why I bring that up is, I, uh, I did a lot of research on this about a year and a half ago where I wanted to better understand the intersection of being Asian and disabled. And what I came across was an essay, I think it was a guest, like a guest post on disability visibility where an Asian, an, a disabled Asian woman was talking about the trifecta of being a woman, of being disabled and of being Asian and how parts of her identity discriminated against other parts of her identity. So what I mean by that is, at least in the context of the way I grew up, in certain Asian cultures, death is very taboo, disability is very taboo, and trauma is very taboo. So if I think about the car accident, the embodiment of what the car accident was and what happened, you know, the death and my my subsequent disability became things that we would never talk about. So I actually never talked about the car accident after the car accident happened. And I wore long sleeves all the time to hide my arm. And I would tell people that my dad was away on a trip. And so I think, you know, uh, I've been doing a lot of reflecting recently. And, you know, there are terms that people throw around like gaslighting or toxic positivity, but in a way that was a form of, of, of gaslighting my trauma. Maybe it was like internalized gaslighting, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Which is, I don't want to put a spotlight on shame within my family, right? Because within within the Asian context, it's less about individuality and more about the collective and we exist within this family. And so what that meant to me is that I spent 12 years not knowing how to talk about the car accident because no one ever asked me. And if anyone ever asked me, I would literally bulldoze right out immediately out of the conversation. And that's why I say there was this turning point in 2009 where I became really curious about what it would look like to number to number one and meet, meet other disabled people. And then number two, talk about my story in a way where I wasn't framed as a victim. Mm-hmm. And I think even now, uh, I, I think I did, I, I think I went and I searched like black and disabled, you know, you could search like black disabled lives matter, but anyway, they, mm-hmm. it has like thousands of tags. And then I searched Asian and disabled and it had six, right? So even those of us who do have disabilities within the Asian community, there are a lot of us who are probably not as forthright about our disabilities, especially if 70% of disabilities are non-visible. So I, I wanted to highlight highlight that nuance that exists, which is even within the disability community, I do see, I do notice a little bit of my own erasure of my race in the context of this conversation. Yeah, it's, it's so important. And as you mentioned with the being black and disabled, which I am, um, you know, there, there, that has been a conversation that has been um, more common to see uh, in more recent years, I would say. Um, but it it does, it it shapes the way you view the world and how you interact with people in the world. And, uh, you know, so I I really, I'm glad that you uh, talked about that and how, you know, your one experience was trauma, death and disability all in, all in one. So I I wanted to uh, give you an opportunity to to talk about that. (laughs) For sure. And, And not to mention, right. I mean, I think And I think there's research done, but the Gates Foundation has said that if you're born a woman, your life is automatically harder. And so when you add in other identity metrics, you know, and especially from an Asian immigrant family, like the sons are the prized possession. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the the women are only seen, their sole purpose is around like childbearing and and becoming a mom um, and continuing on the lineage. So so it was almost like before before I became disabled, already in the context of my family, I already knew that I was operating kind of within like a, a, an old age sexist hierarchy. And then this other thing happened, right? right. And so it's it's just trying to grapple all of these things. But I, but I appreciate you giving me space to name that. And, you know, if I look at our, if I look at the disability community, and these have been a couple people who have been part of our clubhouse rooms, like Lolo and Wes and Stephanie yes. and Lachi, I, 
I just like see so many black and disabled people claiming ownership of their blackness and their disability-ness. I made that up. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, <laughs> But I'm curious who those people are in the Asian community, you know, who are just as loud and proud. Um, and, you know, I think Mia Ives, Ives Rubel is one. Um, Alice Wong, Mia Mingus, you know, I, I, I think I'd, I'd, I would love to see a little bit more solidarity among kind of like the Asian, the Asian and disabled community. But, but perhaps given what's happened recently, maybe there will start to be more movement in that direction. Yes. And a um, quick shout out to Wes Hamilton. He was a guest on my podcast over the summer. And uh, as you said, yes, to be able to embrace that and to, you know, be loud about it and proud about, um, you know, having a disability for me, it, it, it's it been a journey. I'm still working towards some thing and some things that I'm sure a lot of people are, um, you know, to fully embrace it more. Uh, as I got older, it definitely has uh, gotten better. I was born with my disability. So, uh, you know, but I, I think you you mentioned something that was really important as well, that for those who acquired their disability, uh, you know, later in life, there's the the grieving process of, you know, of loss, because you, you lost an ability to do something that you were used to doing. So I, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I was able to uh, provide the space for you to talk about that. It's really, um, really important, I think. And uh, that goes into what our, um, what the, the meat of our conversation is uh, today with uh, talking about allyship. And um, so we, we've heard that term, you know, thrown around a lot. And uh, can you just tell us uh, what it means uh, to be an ally, uh, especially for people within the disability community. Mm. So <laughs> I, I wish I had come into this conversation more prepared, but I, I will tell you what allyship means to me. Mm -hmm. And I will frame it in the context of a comment that I received from someone on a series I've, I've started on uh, Instagram and TikTok around how to be a better ally. And someone wrote, I don't need allies, I need friends. And I thought that that was a really interesting way to frame it because, and Art, you were part of our conversation on this as well, because allyship isn't showing up for me and feeling like you're doing like a, you're doing a good thing, right? It's not you feeling good about yourself that you helped a disabled person. Mm -hmm. It's really understanding, I guess, through the lens of equity or, or through the lens of disability justice, that this is the this is the right thing to do to show up at a human level for someone else. Yeah. It's that's so true, and that's um, a great distinction to to make for sure. That um, you know, yeah, it's it's great to have friends. Yes, we you know we all need friends definitely, and uh, to also just be uh, to be that ally and just um, you know work work towards I think work working towards what we would like to see, which is the equity and equality for everybody, uh, whether you have a disability or not, I think is very uh, so important. Um, what are a few ways that those outside of the disability community can become better allies for those uh, who are disabled? Mm. Such a such a good and meaty question. I mean, I yes. feel like this. I feel like this could end up becoming like a multi day a multi day conference or a series, yes. or a, or a li or I should say a lifelong journey, right? And so yes. I, I have often heard, and I don't know who who the attribution is, but um, I've seen something that says that ally is a verb, not a noun. And so when I think about allyship, it's what are the daily actions that we can take in order to show up better for people who don't share similar identities. Mm -hmm. And the first place to start is there's a phrase I often use in my work that that says um, ending discrimination starts with self reflection. And what I mean by that is, I think we need to become much better at asking compassionate questions. And knowing that we currently live in an ableist society, like we live in a culture of ableism. And so if someone says that something that we're doing is ableist or we get called out for something, it's not internalizing that as though we're a bad person. It's instead using that as an opportunity for reflection to say, oh, why did I place a negative value judgment on disability? So, uh, so yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to add that at the beginning because it's something that I've been realizing is that I think people become so afraid of 
acknowledging that they were wrong. So um, an example I can bring up is in the context of everything that's happening right now with the killings that happen in Atlanta of eight people, six of whom were Asian women. Um, I, I've been posting some content about how I've kind of been moving through my grieving and healing process. And someone wrote on my post and they said, by you calling out race, you're racist. And I responded to that and I said, yes, I'm working on unlearning my racist beliefs. How about you, right? So I'm acknowledging that I'm still holding on to, I'm still holding on to, you know, on to ideals of white supremacy, right? Mm -hmm. And actively working to unlearn them. So that's the big meaty one. That, that's the one that is the lifelong journey. And, and, so, I, and so I did want to name that. So, you know, I, I, know I, I know I have internalized ableism. I know that there's colorism that exists within the Asian community. Mm -hmm. I know I'm working to unlearn and build sel uh, better solidarity between, uh, between me and my black brothers and sisters, right? I, I, so, so it's like, yes, yes, it's this yes, and I'm gonna bring the yes, yes and back in. <laughs> so in terms of what people can do to be a better ally, one of the things I'm realizing, and, and I actually just had another podcast episode with another friend about allyship. And one of the things that she said that gave me food for thought is that we can't, when we put expectation on other people of how we want them to behave, we end up getting disappointed. And, and I wanted to bring that up because I'm gonna name a couple things as suggestions, but my hope is that deep down within your heart, you see the humanity of knowing art, of knowing Tiffany and wanting to be better and wanting to be better to us. So what I've noticed is that the best allies come out of proximity. This is kind of what we talked about in our clubhouse room, right? Mm -hmm. Which is how can we get people to care about disability? And sometimes, and I, the, the most effective way I've seen it is, is that you get to know me, you get to know you, and you know us in our entire, in the entirety of our lives, not just my paralyzed arm, not just your disability, you know about my dating life, you know how the news about Asian Americans is affecting me, right? It's like, right right now what's happening in the, in the news has nothing to do with my disability, you know, has nothing to do right. with, with my arm, but mm -hmm. it's another part of my identity and that's part of my experience. So right. uh, I, I did think that that conversation around letting go of expectation and trying to be just compassion on both sides as we continue to learn and fumble together. Like I often tell people that any movement forward is better. So Absolutely. I preface, <laughs> yeah, I, I preface. So again, we've got the self-reflection, the big meaty stuff of the work that people need to do internally to confront their own deeply rooted beliefs around how they view disability and how we have been conditioned in a way to uh, attribute negative value judgment on disability because the definition of disability in itself is ableist, right? It talks about impairments, it talks about limitations. Um, and, and, I, and I want to acknowledge, you know, like there are, there are like limitations and my disability does impact my life, but I don't feel impaired. Um, so anyways, the language mm -hmm. is very important. But this leads me to my third point, which is uh, oftentimes what I encourage people to do is think about what their sphere of influence is because this is a conversation about allyship and I could literally, again, like there are so many ways that we can be an ally. So I will, I'll give you a couple examples. In the context of this podcast, so we're recording a podcast right now that's being recorded on video and also be re being recorded on audio. Mm -hmm. uh, will a transcript and will a transcript be distributed with the distribution of the podcasts? That's one question to think about, right? Mm -hmm. So that's one example of here, here in this sphere of influence of you have a podcast, I have a podcast. How are we ensuring that we're making the content that we're creating, which is audio first, video first, uh, also accessible to those who don't have access, aren't able to access the video and the audio in the same way that those of us who are hearing and those of us who are seeing are able to. So mm -hmm. that's, that's, an ex that's like an example. Another example could be, say you are a content creator on Instagram. Are you adding image descriptions to your content? Like if you're a content creator, are you doing what you can do to make your content more accessible? So let's say you're not a content creator, right? Let's fast forward and let's say you're an entry level person at a company, um, or let's say you're a manager. I think the manager, <laughs> at entry level, I think you probably still have influence too. But as a manager, as a hiring manager, 
are you being cognizant of where you're sharing your job descriptions? Are you targeting and being intentional about wanting to hire disabled people into those roles? Um, we, have, we have research that shows that hiring disabled people is more beneficial from, for your business in terms of more revenue and more profit. Uh, and, um, and so, and then even in the pandemic environment, right? Oftentimes mm -hmm. I hear people talk about, it took a pandemic for people to realize that some of the accommodations that people who wanted to work remotely or people who wanted more flexible hours are now able to get, right? It took a pandemic for people to realize, oh, these right. things that disabled people are asking for, we're able to figure it out. Um, and, and, and so those, those are just a couple examples. It's really thinking, what are the things that are happening in your daily life? And how can I make those experiences more accessible to disabled people? Yeah, that is, um, I love what you originally said, that it's a, that it's a verb. Um, so showing, you know, some type of action and movement of, um, you know, of actively trying. And it's, it's something that is a journey and it takes time. Um, but the effort that people put into things of, you know, like you said, something, something as simple as everybody is on social media these days and just, um, you know, how are you making your content more accessible for, um, you know, adding captions to your videos or, um, you know, at least in your, in your um, caption, in your description of the video, just to write out a transcript of what is being said, just to make an effort of um, showing that you're trying, you know, it's not always easy to do, it's, it's not always going to be perfect, uh, but making the effort is, uh, is what's really important. And then also, I love what you said of, um, you know, of, of not, I, I guess, not being, uh, or, or being afraid of, of not being successful with it. And just, you know, making sure that you try and make sure that you, um, you know, people aren't always going to get it right. And, and as someone in the disability community, not to be so hard on people, <laughs> uh, I think yeah. is a big thing because, um, you know, people, people are putting forth an effort. And of course, there are so many options to choose from when you're choosing captions or transcripts and uh, what works well for some people might not work well for others. And it's, uh, it's, it's just so important that we all uh, work together to, um, to try to just do better in, in the world of accessibility. I know that's a, a great, uh, a very common uh, topic on Clubhouse, the accessibility of the app. Uh, or the lack of accessibility on the app, I should say. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd love to just chime in here on, mm -hmm. on some things that you said, which is uh, I, uh, I think about, I think about the amount of pain uh, that many of us who are disabled have of whether it's a buildup. The, the one thing I didn't mention about the, about allyship is one point of self-reflection is really thinking through when we talk about disability, what type of value judgment are we placing on disability, right? And so oftentimes I talk about how important language is, um, mm -hmm. which, which I haven't talk, talked about as much here because uh, language is important. Again, it's a yes and, like the words we use are really important and we also need people to take action and actually, you know, change our horrific unemployment numbers within our community and the fact that so many of us are kind of living in these cycles of perpetual poverty. But by saying that someone is suffering from their disability, you know, yes. it, it's, it's like, uh, again, it's like, or, or, or when people try to diminish or erase the, the disability experience by saying like, well, you're not really disabled or like, look at all these things that you did despite your disability, right? And so um, oftentimes when I go in and I talk to some of our clients, I say, if you take anything away from this presentation, it is that the biggest thing we need to unlearn is that mm -hmm. disability is not a bad thing and disability doesn't mean that we're broken and disability doesn't mean less than. Right, because I mean, embedded within the definition of ableism is this idea that people see disability as this less than group. Right. The other thing, the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, and you said this so eloquently about, you know, being a little bit more compassionate or forgiving for our non-disabled allies who might not be showing up for us in the way that we want. And so, 
I will, I will yes. And that mm-hmm. <laughs> and say that we're carrying so much pain of not being seen, not having our access needs met that sometimes anger and frustration and it is the way that it does come out. And so mm-hmm. I want to acknowledge and, and validate that that experience does happen because I remember talking to another disability advocate around how, um, how I was noticing that people, that some disabled people were really angry on Twitter. And she went back to me and she said, you know, Tiffany, like we, we just don't know what the whole situation is. And so it's not really uh, like, I, I wouldn't necessarily go out of my way to tone police someone who was really hurting. And oftentimes I heard someone else say this yesterday. They said, sometimes they're hurting so much that they're unable to see anyone else's pain. Um, wow. especially if you hold multiple oppressed identities, right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm bringing this up in the context of, you know, um, in terms of black and Asian solidarity and a lot of, uh, a lot of responses that many of my Asian American friends have gotten from the black community is like, now, you know, how it feels or, or mm-hmm. now, or like, this is what I experience every single day. And it's, uh, Again, this is where my yes and comes in. How can we validate everyone's experiences? And it's okay for me to talk about my pain as an Asian woman, just as it's just as valid for you to talk as a disabled black man, right? right. And, and we don't need to erase our experience to make space for, for other people. So um, I don't know if that's helpful for allies to understand, but I, I guess I, what I would want our non-disabled allies, like if we do come at it from a level of frustration, it's having a little bit, it's having, I think it's having compassion on both sides to understand how many microaggressions, how yes. many ableist microaggressions have we heard or experienced that are coming out in this display of emotion right now? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's definitely the compassion from both sides is um, is it's so important. And I'm, I'm really glad that you, um, that you did bring that up because of, you know, living with a disability, it's rough, it's tough. And, you know, we go through a lot. And as you said, sometimes it just does, it comes out in anger and, um, you know, not necessarily for me, I would say if, if it does come out in anger for me, it's not intentional. It's just, at that moment, it's, that's what this, <laughs> you know, that that's what has come out for me. And, uh, you know, so I do try to, for myself, I try to, um, you know, check myself and see like, okay, I, I don't mean to lash out at people about certain things, but, you know, that was like the last straw kind of situation uh, where, you know, where it does happen. So um, I think a, a good point that you did make is uh, the compassion uh, having compassion from both sides. And uh, it, it's really, it's, it's so important to have this conversation with you. And I'm, I'm glad that I am having it with you and to bring up uh, the current situations that have been going on um, with the uh, Asian, within the Asian community and crimes committed against uh, those, um, those individuals uh, within the Asian community. And just how, how you mentioned uh, previously that you know, it's part of your identity. So this, these types of events do impact you. It doesn't have anything necessarily to do with your disability specifically, but it is part of your identity. So it, it is, um, you know, it's definitely a, a great uh, piece to add to this conversation. So thank you so much for, for uh, bringing that up. Um, the last question I, I have, which I think we've touched on um, pretty much throughout this whole a conversation, which is great, but if you have anything else to add, uh, please feel free to, to add it. Um, and my last question is, why is it important that we have allies who support us uh, as people who live with disabilities? Mm, such a good question. And I, and I get, I get this question a lot. So diversity is open to disabled and non-disabled allies. And Part of the reason why I structured it that way because because I've gotten a lot of asks to create dis- disability only spaces. So I have I have two main reasons, and one is as disabled people, you know, globally we're seventeen percent of the world's population, and uh, and within the U.S. we're twenty six percent. But that means that there's seventy four percent of non disabled people who are who are the majority 
uh, in many of these spaces. And one of the things I've realized is that I don't have access to a lot of spaces where I can't, where I want to bring up these questions around access, right? And if we are out of sight, out of mind, then we're not going to have our needs met, right? You and you mentioned some of the access accessibility concerns around Clubhouse as a platform, but I have noticed how agile the Clubhouse team has been because we are so visible on the platform. I mean, literally every single time I log into Clubhouse, there are like four disability mm -hmm. conversations all happening at the same time. Yes, um, <laughs> I, which which is great even though I want people to come to my Tuesday night conversations. Yeah, I mean, even last Tuesday, there were like four other disability, there was one happening around entrepreneurship. Uh, there was one happening around disability influencers all at the same time, right? And so again, I feel super excited that because we are visible, uh, the Clubhouse team is taking note and, um, and, and so yeah, so that was kind of my first point, which is, as we build solidarity, as we are able to build uh, more non-disabled allies who have access to spaces that we don't, uh, then they can go into these spaces and say, hey, you know, this company is hiring. Have we thought about partnering with chronically capable or inclusively or getting hired to ensure that our listing is available to their, uh, their disability talent pipeline? So that was kind of the first. I think the second is, and I'm trying to figure out the right way to articulate this, but there are a lot of people who are in the disability population, so in that 26%, mm -hmm. but who are not in the disability community. And what I mean by that is, you know, you and I chatted a little bit at the beginning of this podcast about our journeys into taking ownership over our disability identity right, to go out loud and proud, maybe sometimes not as proud, maybe sometimes not as loud, but to say that I'm disabled and this is an experience that influences the way that I move about the world um, and not diminish that experience in, in, in how we go and we, and, we talk about, and we talk about our experiences. So um, by structuring our community as open to disabled and non-disabled allies, we're able to bring people in who might not necessarily claim ownership over a disability identity yet, but as a function of being in our community and seeing how positive and how empowered disabled people are and how real and raw the conversations are, then they come in. Mm -hmm. And what makes my day is when we have a long time lurker <laughs> uh, come and post in the group and say, hey, I've been part of this group for years and I very rarely said anything, but I want to let you know I'm disabled and this is my story. So, um, so we kind of have like two missions happening, both around allyship, which are how can we create spaces that show disabled people what it looks like to be proud, what it looks like to thrive, what it looks like to live well, because I grew up with so much messaging that those were all mutually exclusive, right? A disability diagnosis, uh, harmfully, I had learned was a death sentence, right? I had no, no opportunity, no outlook, no ambition, no dreams, right? right? Why are we continuing to spew that nonsense to 61 million Americans? You know, it's right. just like, um, so, so yeah, so, so sorry, I kind of went off on a little tangent there, but I think we have two roles to play. Uh, one is, you know, I love the, the mission of this podcast to really change the way that we talk about disability. And we're doing that not only for our non-disabled allies, but for disabled people who don't necessarily know if they uh, are, are, are earlier on in their journey, I guess they'll, I'll say, are earlier on in their journey and want to see role models and possibility models of what it looks like to just be authentically yourself. Right. And that is so true, as you said, with the old way of thinking, the old stereotypes that exist of, you know, with uh, with a disability, you can't do this and you can't do that, and and um, to to change all of that and to um, to make it okay for people to accept, uh, you know, their disability when they're ready, and to say like, hey, I although I have a disability, I'm still able to, uh, you know, do a lot of things, and and that's. Um, one of the things I, I love about being able to um, educate students 
is um, it goes back to like what you said and uh, talking to like high school students or middle school students where they're starting to think about their careers that they're going to have. And they, even though I'm just one person and I talk about my story and my experiences, if they go into their profession or go into college and they can start designing buildings that are more wheelchair accessible and uh, just being aware of uh, things like vision impairments and hearing impairments. And as we talked about with the social media posts and adding captions and uh, picture descriptions and, and things like that, just to, um, to educate people and to make them aware that uh, adding these little thing, these very little things that don't take much time to create. There are many apps that will create captions for you and you can just review them and fix them and edit them because they get some words wrong sometimes, <laughs> um, you know, for, for various reasons, but you just go in and edit the words that are incorrect and it, it's easy to do. So just to, um, to make these uh, small changes to your daily life, if you're posting on Instagram or other social media sites, just to um, make it part of your new way of doing things and just slowly but surely adding things, uh, you know, and then it becomes uh, like second nature. You just automatically do it. Oh, does my video have a caption to it? And, uh, you know, so it's, it's really important uh, that we also uh, within the disability community and outside of the disability community have allies that are working to uh, make these changes and, and just let people make people aware of, uh, you know, different things, different accessibility features that exist. So that's, that's really great. And uh, speaking back to Clubhouse, it's, um, it, it's just been so great to be on that app. And, you know, a lot of times I heard somebody say it, and when they said it, I, I had to think about it myself, where they, um, so Clubhouse is, is a place where you go and you use your voice, you actually speak, and there's no wall or no timeline to post on. And uh, what I heard somebody say that, that really touched me was, I've never been in a room with so many other people with disabilities. And it's just like, wow, I usually I am the only person with a visible disability in a room, uh, you know, definitely the only person in a wheelchair most of the time. And, and if I'm using my crutches, I'm most often the only person. Uh, that uses uh, crutches that, that is in the room, a physical room with people. So uh, being visible on that app has definitely uh, made it, made, made people more aware that we are here as, like you said, 26% of the United States population has a disability, 61 million people. That's a lot of people. <laughs> Uh, and 17% uh, of the worldwide population has uh, some type of disability. So um, using apps like Clubhouse and other social media platforms to uh, get our message out and podcast, uh, like so many people have started within the last year, including myself, it's really, um, really, really great to hear more uh, stories and experiences of those who have disabilities. So um, thank you again for this conversation. And before we wrap up, can you just let everybody know where they can find you on social media? Your Instagram is great. I've been loving your, uh, your videos that you've been posting about how to become a better ally and um, would definitely love for you to uh, share where they can find you on social media, your websites and everything. <laughs> sure. So uh, if you are looking to uh, follow me, Tiffany Yu, my handle is I'm Tiffany Yu. It's the letter I, the letter M, and my first and last name across all platforms. Uh, and then if you are disabled or a non-disabled ally and looking to get involved in community, you can check out Diversability, uh, D-I-V-E-R-S-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y, also across social media. Great. Thank you so much. And um Looking forward to our uh, clubhouse conversations that you host on uh, Tuesday nights, right? <laughs> so I will, uh, we're recording this on a Monday, so I will be uh, in that room tomorrow night for sure. <laughs> and uh, thank you for uh, this great information and uh, for sharing your knowledge and your personal experience of uh, living uh, with a disability and um, for sharing your story. I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I look forward to uh, working with you and collaborating with you in the future again. So thank you so much and have a, uh, have a good rest of your day. Of course, you too. Thanks so much. All right. Have a good day. <laughs> 
Thank you for listening to this episode of the Our View podcast. Leave us a review wherever you listen and let us know what you liked about this episode. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to follow us on all social media platforms for more disability-related content at Our View for Life. That's O-U-R-V-I-E-W, the number four, L-I-F-E. If you listen to this episode on your phone, take a screenshot and post it to your Instagram or Facebook stories and be sure to tag us. We thank you for listening and take care. (laughs) 